Hello and welcome to New Central Television. I am Likon Nobanjo. The headlines at this hour. Serap sues President Tinumbu over missing $3.4 billion loan from IMF. Nema denies looting of his warehouse in Abuja. Over 170 persons executed in insurgent attacks on villages in Burkina Faso. Details to come your way shortly. And now we tell you that the Socioeconomic Rights and Accountability Project has filed a lawsuit against President Bola Tinumbu over grave allegations of a missing $3.4 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund intended to support the nation's budget and respond to the COVID-19 crisis. According to Serap, the allegations stem from the 2020 Nigeria Annual Audited Report by the Auditor General of the Federation. The suit filed last Friday at the Federal High Court in Abuja demands thorough investigation and accountability from the highest office in the land. Sarah's demands are clear. They seek a directive for President Sinumbu to probe the disappearance of the IMF loan, ensure the prosecution of those responsible for any mismanagement or diversion, and secure the full recovery of the missing funds. The organization argues that such actions are vital to addressing Nigeria's economic crisis and debt burden. In the meantime, the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, has denied media reports alleging that the agency's warehouse was looted in Abuja by residents of Guagua Karimo in the FCT. The agency's head of information unit, Manzo Ezekiel, clarified that the looted warehouse does not belong to NEMA. It added that the director general of the agency, Mustafa Habib Ahmed, has directed zonal directors and heads of operations to strengthen security in and around the agency's offices and warehouses nationwide to prevent any security breach at NEMA facilities. According to the report, some FCT residents had on Sunday looted a warehouse located at Phase 3 region of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja over the current economic hardship across the country. Now, the Nigeria Labour Congress has told President Bola Tinumbu that members of the union are not interested in any political position, including his office. The president, during the inauguration of the Lagos Red Line project on Thursday, threw a jibe at the labor unions, telling them to stop their protests and maintain peace, as they are not the only voice for Nigerians. He told the labor unions to wait for 2027 if they want to participate in the electoral process. But responding in a statement, the NLC president, Joe Ajairo, said they are not interested in Tinumbu's position but are demanding that he implements all the agreements the labor unions reached with the federal government following the removal of fuel subsidy. Earlier, we were joined by a lawyer and political analyst, Taiwo Jumo. I think uh, it will depend severally on the perspective one is looking at it from or the side one belongs. Uh, for instance, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, Mr. President, uh, you understand uh, the undertone in in what he said, uh, undertone in the sense that uh, you, you recall that uh, a few months ago, during the build-up days of the election, uh, the Labour, the NLC, the Labour, uh, Nigerian Labour Congress, which organised speaking should be uh, a political, uh, or yes, um, endorsed publicly endorsed the presidential candidate of the Labour Party and the president, of Mr. Peter Obi, and so um, if you look at that background, then the, the support, the support they, they gave to him. That 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 is perhaps one of the reasons why the president, who who is the ruling party, who is the member of the ruling party, feels that uh, whatever comes out from such a body uh, will have some political undertone. Uh, that is one one part. Then, if you look at it from the other angle too, agreement is agreement. The the, 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 the labor the Nigerian labor congress is doing its job uh, because the, the the group is a pressure group and uh, the pressure group in charge of the welfare of. Of the, of the Nigerian workers, and mm. so um, the the Labour Labour Congress has a very good point in that uh, in uh, on second of October 2023, a, a memorandum was was signed. I know it was signed, and an agreement were agreement was reached that uh, the federal government would fulfil 
some 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 I mean some palliative measures to cushion the effect of uh, the removal of poor subsidy. Now, the Nigerian president who has begun to engage the business community is set to later join his host at the Palace of the Emir of Qatar for the signing of a seven-point agreement. Governors and ministers have pointed out areas that Nigeria could benefit from Qatar. Governor Ubasani of Kaduna State cited the areas of agriculture, particularly livestock farming, as one of the most important areas that Nigeria's business community can benefit from. Sani noted that Nigeria's solid minerals development plans will also get a boost as a result of the engagements, especially by the sub-national governments. Nigeria and Qatar jointly have stakes in the future of gas as the debates are on as to the future of the gas commodity in the energy transition plans. The Minister of Youth Development, Jamila Ibrahim, expressed high hopes for the Nigerian youths as the ministry was able to mobilize youth to Qatar on the president's instructions to engage with their business community for mutual benefits. Away from investments, a prospect stories. Now the Nigerian Navy ship Beecroft Operation Delta Sanity has arrested a Ghana-owned motor tanker, Swift Marie, involved in suspected crude oil theft. The vessel was arrested 174 nautical miles off the coast of Nigeria, approximately 320 kilometers, heading to Benin Republic. According to a statement by the NNS Base Information Officer, Lieutenant H. Ibrahim, the motor tanker called Swift Miri Vessel had 13 crew, one Ghanaian and 12 Nigerians on board at the time of arrest. The flag officer commanding Western Naval Command, Rear Admiral M.B. Hazan, was quoted in a statement as saying that the vessel was carrying about 2 million liters of the suspected product without approval and had switched off its automatic identification system to avoid detection on February 25, 2024. The Nigeria Immigration Service has been tasked to ensure adequate measures are put in place to protect the nation's borders. This was during the declaration of the newly appointed Comptroller of General of the Service in Abuja, where she was tasked to reposition the service for greater service delivery. Amadin Uyi reports. It was a declaration ceremony of a new Comptroller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service. In attendance were senior officials of the service and representatives of sister security agencies. The new controller was tasked to reposition the service and improve on its effectiveness. Today, you start your new role and we expect a lot of commitment and sustaining the, tri the strides made in the immigration services so far. You were chosen based on merit. You have worked hard for the whole much is given. We want you to please also be a team player. Be a team player. God has given you your eyes. I always say this at every point in time. God had the choice of giving us eyes at the back. What he decided to give us because he wants you to move forward. This is not a time to remember the ills of anybody. This is the time for you to know that you are only as strong as the weakest person in your service. Bring everybody together. She was also tasked to be considerate in her decision making process and work with all staff of the service. In your decision-making process, I thank you. Always understand the diversity of our nation. The minister also tags the new controller on border security. I will not judge you by what you have performance in passport administration. Take my word for it. That's a done deal by the grace of God. But I will judge you by how do you protect my border. Because... The safety of Nigeria depends on how well we can secure our border. 
As I step into this role, I want to first assure our fellow Nigerians that I am fully prepared and committed to serving our nation with utmost dedication and integrity. To that end, and under the guiding principles of the Renewed Hope Agenda, set forth by His Excellency, President Tinumbo's administration, we will strive towards unity, growth, and development. The new Controller General assumes her role as the 19th Controller General of the Nigeria Immigration Service. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Now, a 27-year-old man, Chinalu Ogbona, is now in the custody of the Abia State Police Command over the alleged murder of his 57-year-old father. The young man who was said to have escaped from the hospital where he was taken for treatment by his father after he manifested a strange behavior on Sunday, returned home only to allegedly strangle his father to death. New Central's Chinwa Ogeli tells us more citizens were on Tuesday protesting the harsh economic conditions in the country. Others decided to follow a dangerous path to economic advancement. The quiet community of Umawaya Amuzuku in Umaha North Local Government area of Abia State was thrown into commotion on that fateful day over the alleged strangling of Mr. Madoka Obunna, a tenant from Umwehihe Amoda Isuchi in Umunochi Local Government area of Abia State by his only son Chinalo. Neighbors gave account of the unfortunate incident. Some days before then, the boy was behaving like a mad somebody, like a mad man. So on Monday, the boy is like he was in his pursuing his father inside on Monday. In on Monday, yeah, Borongwaya Haga was the FMC. Hang away from him. See, no ruin from him. See, the boy, I have put him on watch. So, but at any moment, yada. Papi is so rude. Lotta, when I go away, I know everybody will know that. You are not asking Papi. Confess, confess. You are a, you are a bad man. Confess. Go to church. Confess. The various accounts confirmed that the disease love for China will cost his untimely death. Bawa re yamba. I will keep a chamba. Bawa daddy, Papi yada. He complain area to Papi. Papi ya abawa kuragi. Be running, uh, walking, uh, walking up and down, um, threatening people, you know, that kind of thing. Chinalo's grieving stepmother, Joy Ubunna, said she would have been the victim if she had failed to move out of the house two years ago. I'm not happy. I am crying because I did not expect that. I take this child to hospital, you know, that when he act like a, uh, 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 like a madman. I took him to hospital to the uh, uh, FMs. He ran away. The police public relations officer, Maureen Chinaka, said the police are investigating the crime while the suspect will soon be charged to court. Investigation reveals that, revealed that he um, said he intentionally harmed his father. Actually, he killed his father so he could use his father's left eyes for mortuary purposes for ritual purposes rather. So we are investigating and we'll charge to court. The police will also be investigating an earlier incident where a man from the same Isochi in Umunochi local government area of Abia State also allegedly shot dead his son for consuming the only cooked food in the home. In Omahefonio Central, Chinwe Ugili. You watch your news now. We go on a short break, and when we return, there'll be more for you. Many thanks for staying with us. Now, a drama ensued in Nigeria's federal capital territory as the Nigeria police has finally apprehended a female lawyer who has been accused of burning several parts of the body of a minor with hot iron, including a private part of her claims of sexually abusing her son. The suspect who was paraded at the Ministry of Women Affairs in Abuja was initially on the run with a 2 million naira bounty placed on her head. Nigeria's Minister of Women Affairs assured citizens that she will face the full weight of the law. Amadin Uyi reports. The case has sparked national opera 
following reports on social media. The suspect, a female lawyer resident in Onisha, had accused her maid of abusing her son and following efforts to discipline her, burned several parts of her body, placing a hot knife and pepper into her private parts before tying her up without food for over a day. Nigeria's Minister of Women Affairs had placed a two million naira bounty on her head after she took to her heels. We no go agree again. You tamper with any child, we tamper with any woman, you will see action, legal action. Any kind of action you need, you will see it. She dropped the young girl with her hands, you know, with her cloth, with the bones on the cheek, with the bones on the buttocks, and with blood and water oozing out of the private part, the aunt raised an alarm. And the alarm attracted passers-by who brought out their phones. We know what Nigerians do with the phones. And they started recording and videoing and taking pictures. And this went straight to the, um, to the social space. The Minister of Women Affairs while parading the suspect at the ministry's headquarters in Abuja says that she will not escape the law. The suspect, however, denied the allegations, saying the bonds and others on the victim were not intentional, but acquired mistakenly when being disciplined for sexually abusing her son. This is the lady you asked for. We have brought her and we are assuring you that till we get justice for that girl, till we get justice for the nation, we will not let go. Before she was brought, we've already gone to court with the police and all her bank accounts are blocked. She can't assess her money and she won't assess it until such a time because that is what was giving her money she was using to keep this case down all this while before the bounty was announced. So let me see where she gets the money from. She entered with her because she was running away from King and she mistakenly sat on the, on the gas of food, of food on fire. That was what happened to her. The blade, the blade, go to her skin, the blade of the gas, the blade of the gas. The minister and the police are assuring that the suspect will be charged to court and there will be justice for the victim. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. When I tell you that Nigeria ranks lowly 139 out of 156 countries in the World Economic Forum's Gender Gap Index, and many, especially women, have raised concerns that the country may be regressing in female representation in leadership. Bridging this gap as part of the reasons March is designated the month for gender equality by the Sustainable Development Goal Initiative. News Central's Omolola Oladi tells us more in this report. According to the United Nations, one out of every three women experience physical, sexual or intimate partner violence and one in every 10 married Nigerian women report experiencing sexual violence in a lifetime. Nigeria recorded 27,698 cases of sexual violence between 2020 and 2023 alone according to the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs. The increase in the number of sexual and gender-based violence cases is becoming alarming. A situation experts say can be attributed to several cultural norms in the country. We found that 55% of all the killings um, affecting women and girls are happening essentially at the hand of a family member or an intimate partner. Now, 55% that is for women and girls. For men, it's only 12%. So the home is not a safe haven uh, for women and girls. And we need to be very honest with ourselves. That is the result of um, thousands of years of probably, to some extent, misled cultural developments that we need now to rectify uh, slowly. Cultural norms and practices in Nigeria are factors responsible for a large number of issues, especially regarding women and girl children. Nigeria ranks the lowest, coming 54th, with 5.45% female representation, while Rwanda ranks first with 47.95%. From 1999 till date, only 157 women have been elected into the 469-member National Assembly, 38 senators and 119 members of the House of Representatives. 
compared to 2,657 men, 616 senators, and 2,041 representatives during this same period. Nigerian female politicians therefore talk about the challenges as well as the way forward. That if you are a woman into business or an entrepreneurship, you are more likely to make policies that would support this group of people because that's the area you know and an area you're familiar with. And so when we're talking about making changes and bringing more people on the table, we are advocating that you bring a variety of people on the table so that they will also influence policies and create impact in their various spheres of life rather than making a particular sector. While representation of women in politics and decision making is crucial to the nation's development, more important is the education of the girl child across the six geopolitical zones. Nigeria has a record of 18.5 million out of school children, out of which 10 million are girls, according to UNICEF. Then the issue of culture and then tradition comes to play. Most of the times they are thinking, okay, when she's uh, 18 years, the highest I can do is to give, it, give her out to, uh, in marriage. And with this, why will she even go to school now? Because when, I, when she gets married, the essence of education is the fetus. They are not looking at the education as a, as a means to empower her to take good care of herself as a, as a person. In Nigeria, another major issue that stands as a threat to the education of the girl child is early child marriage, particularly in the northern part of the country. Many of these girls find their education cut off, that is if they had any access to an education in the first place. Despite the prevalence of child marriage among some sections of the country, child marriage remains illegal in Nigeria. Child marriage um, causes um, social isolation, gender inequalities, and it also launches a girl on a cycle of poverty. I'm calling on our government, though they are trying their best, but um, I want them to um, fully implement the Child Rights Act because it's a law that um, actually protects the rights of children in general. So I feel it's a great one and it will help to protect um, girls from being married at an early age. Sadly, the female gender in Nigeria seems to experience a gender inequality in different aspects of her life. The cultural norm in eastern Nigeria deprives a woman of a husband or father's inheritance. Although the Supreme Court's judgment grants an inheritance to the girl child in Igbo land, putting an end to a culture that has held the society together as patriarchal, some women still suffer this discriminatory act. We can also look at how we can strengthen our legal aid services, that is strengthening um, legal services to assist women who are facing discrimination and challenges in claiming their inheritance. We can also look at engaging further with community members through um, community dialogues, that is intergenerational dialogues where you bring different age groups in the communities to come together to discuss uh, misunderstandings, mis misconception, and uh, stereotypes that may limit women and girls from enforcing their right to inherit properties. While the Nigerian constitution provides for gender equality and non-discrimination, women continue to suffer injustices and marginalization as a result of discriminatory laws, religious and cultural norms, gender stereotypes and low levels of education, among others. The hope of the Sustainable Development Goal is that in the month of March, Countries where gender inequality thrives, which includes Nigeria, should pay attention to laws and policies that will help dismantle these barriers and pave the way for women to thrive in the society. In Lagos, for News Central, Omolola Ololadi. The growing concern in Nigeria to put measures in place to tackle the prevalence of social vices threatening the future of students has once again become the centerpiece of discussions, while some experts in Nigeria are calling for the mandatory drug testing of students to ensure they are not into drugs. Others are calling for the resuscitation of relevant school clubs to keep their minds away from vices. Edon Joseph reports. Secondary school education, unlike primary school education, according to Nigeria's National Policy on Education, 
prepares individuals to be useful members of society and for higher education. Unfortunately, in recent times, many secondary schools across the country are grappling with a myriad of vices ranging from substance abuse, examination malpractice, bullying, and cultism, among others. While social vices among secondary school students have become a national dilemma, some think a lack of discipline by parents contributes to this menace. One in every four students between 15 to 19 years abuse substances, syrup containing codeine and tramadol, not the list of drugs, ranking higher than cannabis. Through our days, when you are going out and say a child misbehaving in the society, and a passerby, a elderly person, who will have corrected the child either by beating, scolding, or paragraphs, or he knows the parents. Apart from that, he will go and report to the parents. But today, nobody cares. They just pass by, and we have seen cases whereby parents have, have arrested teachers for correcting their works. Experts say secondary school vices threatens the moral fabric of the nation and call for continuous advocacy to end it once and for all. A mandatory routine and random drug testing for students is for preventive, not punitive purposes. And early intervention is crucial for achieving success in tackling the menace of substance abuse. The ministry further directed all the school management to increase their surveillance on school biases, most especially now in the era of social media. The principal are hereby directed to sustain relevant school clubs and societies like agri, press, literary, and debating societies, among others, to keep the mind of students occupied with useful thought. These are monsters that, if we joke with them, they can bring us down in totality. They are also calling for partnership with parents to help keep their words in check. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Coming up, over 170 persons executed in insurgent attacks on villages in Burkina Faso. We have details after the break to join us again. The news continues in West Africa where a regional prosecutor says around 170 people were executed in attacks on three villages in northern Burkina Faso. The attacks by unknown assailants were carried out on the villages of Kumsilga, Nodin and Soro in the Atenga province. According to a statement on Sunday, the incident happened a week ago, adding that an investigation had been launched. The West African Sahel nation has been struggling to contain a violent Islamist insurgency linked to Al-Qaeda and Islamic State that have spread from neighboring Mali over the past decade, killing thousands and displacing more than two million people. Now, several hundreds of people rallied in the Senegalese capital, Dakar, on Saturday, calling for the country's postponed presidential elections to be held before April 2 the date when incumbent Macky Sall's term is set to end. The, pro the protesters gathered at a sandy lot in a working-class neighborhood for the protest called by the Resistance Front, an alliance of opposition parties and campaigning groups. A national dialogue organized at the start of the week by the president, but boycotted by the opposition, had recommended holding the elections on June 2. Sall indicated that it would ask the Constitutional Council for its opinion on the request. On espère que la situation va s'arranger par le Conseil constitutionnel parce que c'est elle qui a le droit de rétablir cette forfaiture organisée par le président Macky Sall. Oui, on écoute le Conseil constitutionnel, mais en attendant, on va manifester, on va parler, on va se mettre debout, on va crier pour que Macky Sall rétablisse nos élections au Sénégal ici. 
pour qu'on quitte cette dictature. Nous sommes pas en dictature. Et nous demandons le président Macky Sall de quitter le pouvoir et qu'il organise des élections transparentes. Voilà, c'est ça qu'on veut. Avant le 2 avril, nous voulons des élections et nous demandons la libération de notre candidat Bassirou Diomaye Fay ainsi que de notre président Ousmane Sonko. C'est ça que nous voulons. Moi, là, de ce que je vous parle, je ne vais jamais laisser. Je l'ai jusqu'au bout. Parce que c'est ça que nous, qu on nous avons appris. On ne va jamais laisser. On va combattre jusqu'à donner nos vies. Parce que dans cette vie-là, soit on vit, soit on meurt. C'est ça qui nous retient ici. Et mourir pour la bonne cause. Delegations from Hamas, Qatar and the United States have arrived in Egypt for a new round of negotiations toward a truce in the Gaza war. Cairo, Doha and Washington have mediated in weeks of talks aiming to pause the fighting in the almost five months old war between Israel and Hamas sparked by the October 7 attacks. Their goal has been to secure a truce by the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan next week, but hopes have been dampened by a series of failed talks. The negotiations have centered on a proposal to pause the fighting for six weeks and for Hamas to free hostages in return for the release of Palestinian prisoners from Israeli jails and greater aid deliveries. Still ahead on the news. Seven-year-old girl killed in Channel Crossing. We will bring you more on this when we return from this break. Don't go away. From other continents, we tell you that a seven-year-old girl drowned on Sunday when a small boat carrying 16 migrants heading from northern France to Britain capsized. The boat was not appropriately sized to carry so many people, causing it to capsize soon after people boarded in the canal, a few kilometers from the waterway's exit into the channel. The inland accident is the latest in the trend that has seen migrants aiming to get to Britain from France, boarding boats away from the coast to avoid stepped-off surveillance there. C'est une petite fille de 7 ans. D'accord. Qui ont été récupérées par les plongeurs de... Oui, oui, oui. oui. Tout le monde. Les pompiers ont très vite intervenu. Nous, mmh. ici, on a fait le maximum. On a, on a déclenché le plan de secours communal. Donc, on les a accueillis dans une salle de sport. Et puis, bon, ils ont pu prendre une douche. Et avec une, une association d'insertion, ici, qu'on appelle Flandre Insertion, euh, on a pu avoir plein d'habits. Plein et puis, ils ont pu se rhabiller et, et être au chien. J'ai appelé ce matin à 7 h euh, pour une embarcation, on dire un petit bateau de pêche qui a chaviré. Il y aurait une quinzaine de personnes sur ce, sur ce bateau. Mais sinon, ce n'est pas fréquent. On avait juste été informé par la gendarmerie il y a à peu près 15 jours qu'un bateau avait été volé et qu'il s'était retrouvé à un bateau un petit peu plus grand. Euh, ils avaient réussi quand même à aller jusqu'à l'Angleterre. Mais s'ils étaient certainement, à mon avis. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC, tells a news conference that employment is key focus ahead of the start of annual legislative meetings in Beijing on Monday. The CPC Central Committee and the State Council have given priority to promoting employment after Beijing reported economic growth of 5.2% last year, one of its lowest rates in decades. The meetings come as the world's second largest economy battles a range of challenges from a protracted property crisis to flagging domestic consumption and persistently high youth unemployment. The Gulei 
We now go on a short break right now to bring you the rest of the news thereafter. Do stay with us. Let's talk business now. Leaders at the Gas Exporting Countries Forum Summit held in the Algerian capital have unanimously adopted the Algiers Declaration, which condemns unilateral economic sanctions. According to the GECF Secretary General, member countries reiterated the condemnation of all unilateral economic restrictions undertaken without the prior approval of the United Nations Security Council. Countries reiterate uh, their condemnation of all unilateral economic restrictions undertaken without the prior approval of the United Nations Security Council and any extra extraterritorial application of national laws and regulations against GECF member countries that negatively impact <laughs> لأنها مهمة جدا في منشآت عابرة للحدود هذه المنشآت التي أشرنا إليها في هذا في إعلان الجزائر أول مرة نريد Talking sports now national youth champion Matthew Kuti have been uh, included in the 10 man now, Kenyan Benson Kipruto set a new course record in the men's Tokyo Marathon on Sunday, finishing in 2 hours, 2 minutes and 16 seconds. He broke the previous record held by former world record holder Elude Kipchoge in perfect racing conditions on the streets of the Japanese capital. Kipruto outpaced Timothy Kiplagat in the final kilometers to win the Tokyo title, finishing 39 seconds ahead of his compatriot. This victory adds to his numerous wins. Now, in the women's race, Ethiopia Sutume Asefe Kebede finished first, clocking two hours, 15 minutes, and 55 seconds. She beats uh, Kenya's defending champion, Rosemary Wanjiru, and also set a new women's course record from Shinjuku to the Imperial Palace. <laughs> No es que lo terminás con lo que te queda, sino que das todavía un poco más. Es extraordinario. Lo que es la motivación de ver la llegada, ¿no? Still talking sports, uh, Burkina Faso's Hugues Fabrice Zango clinched gold on Saturday in the triple jump event at the World Indoor Athletics Championship in Glasgow. Zango's sleep of 17.53 meters surpassed a strong opening effort by Algeria's Yassar Mohamed Tikri. At first attempt, it recorded a 16.69 meter leap, despite Mohamed Tikri's 17.35 meter jump. In the second round, Zango responded with a 17.33 meter jump, then went on to clinch gold with a 17.53 meter jump on his fifth attempt, adding a World Indoor Championship gold to his medal hall of an Olympic bronze medal and World Athletics Championship silver. As you see, at Budapest, I, I, I won with the fifth jump also. So, for me, I, I'm like a diesel. I, I just uh, go, I build my, my, my event, I just build my competition step by step. With my first jump, I jumped like 16, 69. It was not great, but I took some information. For my second jump, I took some information. For my, so I built my competition. Then I knew that at fifth and sixth jump, Lakers power forward LeBron James became the first NBA player to reach 40,000 career regular season points at the weekend game against the Denver Nuggets. James scored the historic basket with 10 minutes and 39 seconds remaining in the second quarter with a driving layup from the left side of the basket to give the Lakers a 37-32 lead. Despite this historic moment, the Lakers fell to a 124-114 loss to the defending NBA champions, the Denver Nuggets. James became the NBA's all-time leading scorer in February 2023, passing Karim Abdul-Jabbar's long-standing record of 38,387 points. He is currently a four-time NBA champion, four-time most valuable player in his 21st season, and is the league's oldest active player. Um, that's, that's super cool for sure. Uh, 
you know, she's the best. Um, definitely a girl dad, and uh, you know, happy she's a she's a part of the family. She runs the, She runs everything. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we take a look at some of our top stories. We told you that Serap sues President Tinubu over missing $3.4 billion loan from the IMF. Neymar denies looting of its warehouse in Abuja. And finally, we let you know that over 170 persons have been executed in insurgent attacks on villages in Burkina Faso. Do send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. You can follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also watch News Central Live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Likon Onobanjo.